Good morning. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to pray. But I wanted to talk for a second before we pray. Because sometimes, I'm just going to put this right out there. Sermon title is this. This is what I think sometimes, and I'm guessing this is what you think sometimes. Praying is boring. Um, it might it might sound like who would say something like that in a sermon? Praying is boring. It's shocking. It's right out there. But I'm, my guess is some of you are kind of a little offended by that, but the vast majority of you are like, I, I hear you. I'm not going to say that in a church. I'm not going to. I'm not, not going to be admitting that when we're having our prayer meetings and stuff like that. But seriously, praying's kind of boring. People tell us it's 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 part of being it's a vital part of being a Christian. It opens up our heart to God, right? That's what, it's a relationship where we just talk, just me and God as friends. We're just we're just talking with Him. It changes things. Prayer changes things. We know all these things, but. But we don't know all these things. I mean, it seldom does change things, right? At least this is what it feels like a lot in our hearts. I mean, we, you know, we, we hear that, that wonderful saying, right? Well, God's answer is always, he always answers prayer. Yes, no, or not right now. And if you ever stop to think about it, like, yeah, but those are the three answers, whether he's like, that's all the, there are no, of course that's the answer. Whether he's there or not there, that's what the answer is going to be. It's going to happen, it's not going to happen, or it's not going to happen yet. I, that's not really that helpful for us. And he's like, well, God never, like I, sometimes I talk and he never really talks back to me. How can there be a relationship if I'm just talking to empty air? I've never heard the voice of God in any way. Most of the time, when I, when I finish, I don't feel any closer to God. People talk about that closer to God. That, you know, we, it's just the, our, we, we enjoy, I just, I just enjoyed the presence of God this morning. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. Anyway, sweet hour of prayer? Like, who are these great Christians that used to pray for an hour? I know some of you are like, I pray for an hour. But 98% of you are totally with me right now. If I can pray for three minutes in a row intentionally, I'm kind of impressed with myself. And then the pride starts. And then i got to spend another minute just asking God for forgiveness, Right? This is what we're feeling. My emotions aren't moved. If it's a vital part of me being a Christian, then I got to stop and go, I wonder if I'm really even a Christian. Because I, I, I struggle with this. The statistics, oh my goodness, they're frightening. I don't even want to scare you with most of the statistics, but if you're older than me, then you are the ones most likely to have a religious or spiritual, emotional, like so, like it, 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 you had a satisfying experience in prayer, if you're older than me. But even those people, it's only 20% of you who would say that. That there was an actual, like something is satisfying has helped you. Four out of five of you have prayed in the last week. You hear what that means, right? If I do my math right, that's 20% of you haven't prayed in the last week. Three out of five of you have prayed in the last day. That's only 60% of people who are in church that have prayed in the last day. These stats include things like, you know, how some of our prayers are. Things like, um, Lord, watch over my kids today. Or, Lord, get me a better parking place. Or let the lights be in my favor. Those kinds of prayers. That includes those kinds of prayers in those statistics. And even healthier churches, and you know, I don't, I don't know about our church. I don't know where we rank on healthiness. I think we're a pretty darn good church, but I'm a little biased. I see with blinders, right? I think you guys are awesome. But I looked at another really church that I thought was really healthy, and the statistics from their poll that they took, they said that um, three out of five of them don't set aside any time for prayer. That doesn't mean that three out of five of them pray. That's not what we're saying here. But they don't, like most of them probably pray. But they don't set aside, like, I'm going to pray for these five minutes of my life here. I've got 20 minutes uh, in the morning from 5.20 to 5.40. I woke up early just to be, like, they didn't intentionally set aside a time for prayer. Three out of five of them did. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing that statistic probably holds true here. Right? This isn't a vital part of our life. That just feels like that's such an antiquated thing that people like have a devotional time. They go aside and they just pray. Or if you have a devotional time, isn't it mostly studying? 
You know, like I, I, I read the Bible, but when it comes to stopping everything and just talking to God, we're, we're, and because I think the truth is, for a lot of us, praying is boring. Like at least we're getting something out of the Word. Being, we're reading it. We're at least learning something. And, and I, I just don't want to be one of those pastors who tells you, you know, what a delightful hour of prayer I spent this morning before coming to worship. I mean, I'd love to be, actually be one of those pastors, but I didn't. Didn't spend a delightful hour of prayer. I can't even remember the last time I prayed for any time close to an hour or a half hour. So I guess I want to talk to the people here who are religious, spiritual. You know Jesus and you're in. Like, you're in. This, like, there's really, I, I believe this stuff. I am a Christian. I am, I'm in. And you still get what I'm saying when I say all this other stuff. Like real life is, I, I, I just can't pray. But also, I want to talk to those of you sometimes who, you know, like you're with me on all the stuff I'm saying, but sometimes there's a connection. It's what keeps you coming back even for the two minutes at a time or three minutes. Sometimes you break through that ceiling, that empty air, and there's something that happens I'm not claiming this happens on any kind of regular basis with me, but sometimes you move from this kingdom, you know, the kingdom of us and our world and our focus, and you actually focus truly on the kingdom, and you enter in and you see something and you meet with God for real, like you really meet with God. And you have that time where just like you, like you can't just be alone and you, you have to tell somebody because something different has happened. You know, you have your normal time of prayer where you just, it's not really exciting. It's boring. I'm telling you, I got to do it. I know I got to do it. But then sometimes you're just like, I got to call some, something just that some of you have had that too. Okay. That that's who we are. We're, we're one from one point to the other. We're in all of this. So I, I want to pray now. Like that's all introduction. I want to pray so we can start the sermon. <laughs> I want to pray for us in all of our inadequacies, with all of our secret hurts about how good of how good of a, you know how, how we've been hurt in the past, but, and, and our doubts, our secret doubts about how good of a Christian we really are, and maybe even some of our doubts about whether God is even really there, because sometimes it certainly doesn't feel like that, and even logically, sometimes we can't bring ourselves to be there. And, and I want to pray for us because. Honestly, maybe for some of you, this is the first or the most intimate time. Like we've already prayed a couple of times. Maybe those that that represents your prayer time this week, where you actually had an intentional time where you stopped and you prayed, and that's it. So we're going to do that again, just for a minute as we start intentionally. Here's you, you guys you get you get to talk to God now. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Like, you get to reach outside of this world into his world. You get to meet with God now, even if it's only for 30 seconds or a minute. That should blow you away. So we're going to pray. Are you ready? Hold on to your hats. (laughs) Let's pray. I've said that prayer is boring. I said it out loud in a church, and I think you still love me. I ask, Father, this morning that you will reveal yourself to us, no matter where we're at in our walk. There's some people here who have been praying and praying an hour a day for their whole life. And there are some people here who have never probably uttered a single word of prayer. Some people have relationships with you are strong and some aren't sure whether they even want a relationship with you or even sure that you're really even there at all. Wherever they're at, Lord, I pray that you'd reveal yourself to us today, wherever we're at in our journey. You would show grace to us in all of our inadequacies and in our sin and our failures and in our inability to speak and in in to pray and our admitting even that sometimes praying is just boring and we can't do it and we don't want to do it and we're we'd rather watch tv we're sorry we want i think most of us here we would love to have that kind of connection with you would you help us today 
just to see a few more little insights into you. These these words that that I'm going to say, they're not profound. They're simple. <laughs> they're so simple. But maybe with your spirit coming alongside them, maybe maybe they'll spark something for us. That's the only way anything that I say will spark anything is if your spirit does its work, so does his work. So help us this morning to learn from this sermon that Jesus preached. In your name we pray, amen. I I don't know much about the day that Jesus preached his sermon. All right, we know that he, according to, look at Matthew chapter 5 if you want. We're going to be in chapter 6, but... Right before chapter 5, actually the very end of chapter 4, it says that large crowds followed him. Right from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, the region across the Jordan. All I know is he came to this mountain. There was tons of people from cities all around. That must be thousands of people, I'm guessing. And we know there were thousands from other times that he preached. This must have been a huge thing. He climbed up on this mountain and he begins to speak to these people. He begins to give them which is probably the most amazing, certainly the most familiar sermon that we know. And he told them that they could be happy. If they wanted to be really truly happy, here's what they could do. They needed to care most about humility and justice and peace those were the things that would make them happy i know it just blows what what you, how can those be the things that's that's what we call the beatitudes that's how he began this sermon and then he said they're not going to flourish they're not going to be happy and blessed and all this stuff with with what everybody else is blessed with right it's not going to be about money it's not going to be about prestige it's going to be when they focus not on themselves and building their kingdom but when they focus on his kingdom in fact in chapter six a little bit later he's going to say seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all the other things will be added to you if you just seek his kingdom and this is going to be the, this is the whole focus. If you haven't heard anything in the last three or four or however many months I've been going through this, you're going to hear that theme over and over again. It's about his kingdom and entering into his heaven. He invited them into something that was so upside down and so beautiful and so like uh, just change life changing for them. If they just come in, it wasn't about laws. He's saying he's going to say you should do this. You should that. But it's not about laws. It's about being more righteous than the Pharisees. But not in the sense that you obey the the structure that's set around you, but that your heart and your and your actions go together. The things that you do match with what you think and how God is calling you. He's going to call them to be salt. He's going to call them to be light. Right They're They're being called to be flavor. Remember that flavor out there to be to bring some variety and some joy and light in a dark world they're they're called to do all this and and how do they do that well it's not it's not about just stopping murdering it's not about just stopping from from committing adultery he's going to his list of laws from the old testament that's not really what it's about it's really about not being angry with others not even lusting not just you shouldn't even be taking oaths it's not about breaking or it should be you're, you're just honest there, there are very basic ways that we move forward in blessing and abundance and, and flourishing. The problem has been for him in the last four weeks, in the last four little sections that we've done here, three and today, is that there's a lot of doing things, but not a lot of connecting our hearts with those things. Kind of just empty rituals. So he's talked about um, giving to the needy, which is good. But it wasn't, their hearts weren't in those things. They were just doing what they, they wanted to be seen by men. So we talked about fasting last week. That's great. We should fast. But not just to be seen by men. I just ask this. How many of you do the right thing, but a lot of times if you were to admit, your heart's just not there? I mean, and this is kind of who we are sometimes, isn't it? I'm not saying we're always that way. Sometimes our hearts and our, we, they, they link together just well. But sometimes we, we just, maybe you're here right now and you just, you knew you're supposed to do it. It's kind of what you did and you're a little bit bitter about having to come here and I, you just, your just heart's not totally here. So I, I'm going to say a couple of things about that. I say, <laughs> I think God is actually really glad that you're doing the right thing. Even when your heart's not in it. Now, he would love for your heart to be in it. That's what all of this is about. But sometimes your heart hasn't caught up yet. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're just like, 
church. That's not going to be beneficial to me. I'm not going to be fed there. I'm not going to grow. I got something better to do. There's always something better to do. And you decided I'm going to come anyway because I know even though me and God aren't that close right now, I'm going to just go and see and just, I think he's, I, he's just saying, I know where you're at right now and I know where you're struggling. I'm glad you made the right decision. Even if you're not there yet, even if your heart hasn't caught up yet. Or your heart was there yesterday, but it's not there today because someone said something to you and you don't want to be in the pew with them right now. Okay, yeah, you just, in fact, right now, maybe you're glancing over there. Right? You're you're doing the right thing. So I just want to say I'm I'm glad you're here and that I'm hoping that God speaks to you as he speaks to me. You know, sometimes I roll over and say, I don't want to go to church today. They don't like me. That's pretty normal. Pretty normal. And then I come and I'm usually blessed by the people I think don't like me. Because they sometimes don't like me, but they generally do love me. That's kind of what a family's about. So I'm hoping that God speaks to our heart in the most intimate areas like prayer. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, look at this text. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Now, I noticed three things. No, you don't need to be a PhD to notice these things. I didn't do some Greek study to figure this stuff out. It's right there on the surface. It says, when we pray, that you should pray. Right? That's the first thing. You should pray. It's kind of an aside for Jesus. We should pray. It seems kind of obvious in that sense. So that's number one. Number two, don't pray in a certain way. Don't pray like the hypocrites do. They like to pray really out loud and mend the stage and make sure that there are lights shining on them and doing all that stuff. Don't, don't pray like that. And, and the third thing is, There's a reward for those of you who don't pray that way, but pray in secret, who pray sincerely, whose hearts match up with what it is that we're actually doing. So first thing we should pray. It might seem like an obvious thing. Most of you have grown up in the church. Some of you haven't. This whole prayer thing, it's kind of weird. Like you've seen people do it, but it just like it's kind of... Do we just kind of say magical incantational words? What's, what's happening? Like, is there some kind of, so just a few things for those of you who might not be totally into this praying thing yet. Just a, just a a few little things. Thoughts and prayers are not the same thing. Okay. So if you, if you're one of those intellectual types right now and you like to take notes, okay, this is where you fill in the blank with the word same. They're not the same thing. Okay, I just randomly pick places for blanks. I don't, because I'm not a blank person. I don't like doing that kind of stuff. But, but some of you like that, so go ahead, write that down, right? I don't care if you're, if you are or not, it doesn't matter. They're not the same. Prayer and vibes, we just pray for, just give them some, some positive thoughts in the universe. They're not flying through the, I mean, I don't know what's happening in the real world out there and stuff like that. But when, when God says pray, He doesn't mean just thoughts towards you. Pray means, and this is the second thing, Right? I think it's the second thing. Yeah. The word pray means ask. That's, I pray thee. Right? Remember from the old English? I pray thee. I I beg thee. I'm asking you. Okay? That's all, that's all the word prayer means. So we're not just sending positive thoughts some way. We're asking God for something. We're reaching into the divine and saying, this is what we desire. We're asking for something. And it's not our feelings or anything like that. Um, but you know, you know, the word prayer is taken on new meaning. It doesn't just mean ask. Now we say we go to prayer. It's not only asking God for things. It might also be telling God certain things, confessing our sin. It is interesting though. This passage, right? That we're reading right now is going to go into the Lord's prayer, which is five requests, right? Asking. I'm asking that God's name be hallowed. I'm asking that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm asking for my desires to be met when it comes to food and whatever other desires. I'm asking that he would forgive my sins as I forgive others. I'm asking that he would remove this temptation from me, these, that not lead me into these kinds of temptations. They're asking. It is always interesting to me that our prayers take on different forms and other things, and this is our model. We'll talk about that because we're getting to the Lord's Prayer. We're going to take a bunch of weeks to walk through it because I think it's very helpful. But let's stay on this right here. The word pray means ask. Number three, prayers do accomplish something. I know sometimes prayer is boring because we don't think it does anything. But I'm convinced from Scripture and from experience and from many of you that prayer does accomplish something. I don't mean by this that we manipulate God. Okay? 
Let me be very clear about that. God is not some puppet, some Santa Claus in the sky where we speak to him and he does what we say. Think about this as he's inclined to us. That is, he's a father who, here's something really profound, you may never have heard this in church before, who loves you. <laughs> right? He loves you. Think, if, a, if, if my son comes and asks me for something... He's not, in fact, if he begins to do the manipulation thing, because this has happened before, never with my kids, but some of your kids, right? The less holy ones, okay? When they try to manip, you know, I'm kidding, right? If they try to manipulate you, you're certainly not doing what they say, are you? Right? Because you, you, your parents are pretty wise to all that stuff. You, like, you know when that's working, when they're working one off the other or something like that. When they're trying. I don't think we manipulate God in any way, but I mean, a good parent actually wants to please their kids, don't you? Like, you would love to give them what they want. They can't always get what they want, but you have a desire to make them happy. God is moved by us. And the Bible rep shows this all throughout the stories. When people pray, he moves. So that's the third thing. I just wanted to say, he does, I don't know how all that works. I don't know what the connection is. He doesn't always do exactly what we want, but I, I, it, he does, it does accomplish something. Number four, we should pray, but it's not a law. Okay, so I've said should at the front, and now I'm saying, but it's not something that you have to do. You should do it, but you don't have to. Here's what I'm trying. This is what we've been getting through this whole sermon. Jesus is not giving us a new list of boxes you need to check off. He's just saying, here is the path to flourishing. Here's the path to abundance. Do you want to live in this kingdom forever or that one? Here's the way to move into this one. I've set the world up. I'm an order maker. I've set it up so that you can just flow right into that. You can flow into heaven. I don't mean that fictional world where harps and clouds and stuff like that. Please get that world out of your mind, that cartoonish, not heaven world. We're entering into the world where God, God is in charge. God is ruling and everything is just and beautiful. Like we get to get into that world and prayer Prayer is a way to do that. We enter into this kingdom right now, this unimaginable almost, or sometimes it is, sadly, this, this, this world of beauty and grace, that world that is more real and more colorful and more, remember Lord Diggory, more, more of the real thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you have to come to church more often and uh, you'll hear it's all coming together, right? People are hearing that, that all moving together. So it's not a law, but there is what well, we should do. At number five, Prayers are to be done through the power of Jesus. He doesn't say that in this passage. We know that from multiple other passages. In order for us to get to the Father, we come through the Son. We come through Jesus. We come through this cross. Not this one, his cross. We come through his death and his resurrection. Most of us, we're walking our own path. We're living life. We like our kingdom. It's pretty, pretty sweet. More or less, we've got some problems with it, but more or less, we like our kingdom. That's why we haven't jumped out of it too often. We're walking our own path, and he says we can actually walk in a, in a new world. We can move over here into his, his awesomeness, his awesome world. And we do that by noticing that this is our kingdom and confessing our sin. I, you know, we're not, we're not a world that likes the word sin. I'll, I'll use, by confessing our inadequacies, our failures. It's sin! It's fault. It's not going the way that God wants us to be going. It's putting our ego and our life first. It's not seeking first his kingdom. And so we confess that. We say, that's right, God. I haven't been doing that. And I know this is wrong. And I please, will you save me from myself, from my sin? And then we turn and we follow him. That's metanoia. That's repentance. We turn. We do that. And because we've done that, he, we now have access to the Father, to God, just blows my mind we can reach into the supernatural world and come before his throne and he hears us because he loves us because of what he did what jesus did on the cross he took our consequence for sin. So i just wanted to get that out so so all that is under we should pray okay that's number one number two ready for number two you, those of you are writing down everything that you need to write down we shouldn't be doing this for our glory we're not praying for us The problem is that prayer, like extravagant giving and extravagant fasting and things that we're called to do here, they lend themselves to pride. Right? Well, 
I, I'm doing these things. I look, look, I, I love people more than you do. Look what I've done for people. I've brought in twice as many socks and underwear and mine were new and yours weren't. Right? Look at, look at me. I, I, I give up more than you do. I fast even more. I, I don't fast the food, but I fast in other areas. I, I haven't turned on Netflix in four days. Look at me. Right? I'm giving things up for God. Look, look at me. I'm more holy than you are. And if there's one thing that people outside of the church notice about us, it's that we like to think of ourselves as more holy. Right? Look at us. All those other people who didn't come to church. Oh. <laughs> what is it with us? We're here to be fed the word and to hear from God and to go out into the world and reflect him in a beautiful way. Not to think judgmentally about them, them, just to love them. But that's that's what people see us as, as hypocrites. And before you start defending yourself and you start mentioning, well, you know, they, you, I know you've got some reason for they are bashing me. You brought it up three weeks in a row. We're talk- yeah, because we're talking about hypocrisy in the church. Jesus cares about this stuff. And, and we are our problem here. You know, we're, we're known as being hypocrites. We need to stop, stop, not just stop being hypocrites, but stop thinking that we've got some excuse for it. Like, well, they don't really understand. It's always they don't understand. Just focus on what, what they did get right. We are, we've, we struggle with this. We're selfish. We're not centered on his kingdom. We care about ourselves. I mean, the reason... The reason they think these things about us is because they know us, <laughs> right? They know Maybe they know the real you. I hope that's not true, but maybe. I, I heard a story about a deacon. I'm sure it's not true because deacons would never be like this. Certainly not our deacons. We're, we're, we're the holiest of all deacons. I'm sure you know that. You hopefully catch the rolling of the eyes as I say that. And this is not against the deacons, but whoever it is, right? Wait, I heard the story about this, this deacon trying to impress on this class of young boys that he was teaching, um, you know, the, the importance of living a Christian life. And so he asked them, very sincere question, why do you think people call me a Christian? And all of them kind of just kind of looked at each other. And then one person said, maybe, maybe because they don't know you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. What, what do people know about you who know you, for, for who really know you? What do they think about you? How about your spouse? Does he or she know that you give powerful prayers up front? You've got people around, you give these great prayers, but they never catch you on your knees in your room alone. And I wonder how many of you have caught your spouse on, in that situation alone? Do you pray with, I don't know, the moms in prayer group or Wednesday night prayer meeting or, or the women's study or a men's small group or wherever and you pray for healing and you pray for comfort but you, you never pray for humility or for God to guide you in a particular way? I mean, maybe people don't hear those frustrated prayers that you grow in knowledge and grace. Just be, I'm inadequate. I, I'm not getting this. I'm trying to understand but I'm not. They don't hear your, your prayers, that, that you know, your sobs. Or you're begging God for forgiveness for the crap that you put on Facebook this week and didn't represent God well at all. Or the way that you treated your daughter or the truly judgmental attitude that you have towards them, whoever them is. It's always somebody different for all of us. How you look down at them. Do you say, do you say prayers for food every time because that's what good Christians do, but it sounds pretty much exactly the same every single time and it's really just to get to the food? For that matter, let's talk about that. Let's let's um, let, why don't we why don't we play with rituals for a second? Let's see if I can step on some toes here. What about the rituals that we have in our prayers? I, I've been um, binge watching um, Blue Bloods. It's an older show, but I think it might even still be on. Tom Selleck, you guys know Blue Bloods? Anybody? Oh, a few people. Hey, wow! I've connected with somebody on on a show I watch. All right, that's good. Um, Blue Blood. It's it's a nice, clean Catholic family, police and lawyers, right? And and all the stuff that goes on in their life. Every single one, I think, has them praying, right? They pray before the meal and they have a family meal once a week on Sundays or Saturday. I don't know. Who cares? Right. But they meet together and they have a family meal and they all pray. And I, I almost have got the prayer memorized. Right. Because it is the same prayer. But I, I didn't want to try to memorize it. But, so I just I wrote it down. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty. 
Catholics, yeah, you know what this is. Through Christ our Lord, amen, right? So you grew up in a Catholic, in, in a Catholic world, you know this one. This is what they do. And it is a good prayer, right? I mean, as I read that prayer, I like, that's, it says every, I have no qualms at all. I do wonder though, do they even know what they're saying anymore? Right? I looked up what the Baptist prayer is. Um, it's, it's, it's decent enough. Um, it's in the Baptist manual. It's on page 73. It goes like this. It's a little bit complicated. Rub a dub dub. <laughs> Thanks for the grub. Yeah. That, I don't, that's not really ours. I was kidding. But like, do we, do we know what we say when we give these prayers? Do we know what we're asking for? Are you one of those that, you know, starts off your prayers with those bold statements about who God, law, like even say with the Lord, God, Jesus, right? I, I've never heard anybody do that. We're not that kind of church, probably the Baptist, just, you know, we're not, uh, but no, I'm not doing it again. I, it's on tape. If we could just delete that little section on on there, everybody, please. Um. Maybe, maybe you, you're just, you're one of those people who uses the word heavenly father or lord, like over and over again. You know, heavenly father, lord, lord, we pray heavenly father that, that you, lord, would, you know what I'm saying? Like you use the name 400 times in, in two minutes. Like you'd never do that with me. Jace, Jace, I just, I'm just asking Jace that I it just, right? It doesn't fit, but we, we do that. Or maybe it's the word just. Are you one of those people? The just people? You know what I'm talking about there? We just thank you, Lord, because you're just so incredible. I just want to say that we're just, we're just poor, miserable sinners. We just come to, you know what I'm saying? Right? That just kind of fits it. You don't talk like that, but you do with God. It's just kind of, kind of moved into that, that thing. Or maybe you've got the highfalutin eschatological, soteriological words that you put into every single prayer so people know how incredible you are. Dear Lord, our exegesis has grounded us in a biblicism that, and a theology that would make you proud. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm sure that's none of you guys. Are like, I don't even know what he's talking about there. But some, there's a couple of people who maybe, maybe move that way. Or maybe you want to show God and the people around you how, how well read you are. Dear Lord, like, like Richard Foster has taught us, we, we today yearn for prayer and hide from prayer. Yeah, just, you know. Why are we like this? Maybe you're maybe you're one of those down to earth prayers. You, those people drive you crazy. So you are just you're the absolute opposite. Dear God, Jace is here. It's Jace again. I'm I'm just I'm just honestly God. I'm just I'm just freaking mad about what's happening in Rwanda. What the heck, God? Anybody? Maybe not quite so much. Maybe you got those phrases spattered throughout your prayer, but you're not even sure exactly what they mean anymore. You've just used them so often. They just kind of belong in the prayer. I, I, I don't know what yours are. Maybe it's, and we'll be careful to give you thanks. Right? It's a great, great phrase, but it shows up in a lot of our prayers. I hear it pretty regularly. Lord, Lord, bless the missionaries and the starving people around the world. Are, are, do you want them to bless the missionaries? Or are you just saying that? Is that just how you close your prayer? Just, are those things are put a hedge of protection around us. A hedge of protection. None of these are bad things. Hedge of protection. Like apparently, all Satan needs is a pair of loppers. He can get in. I, that's not really um, all that. You know, I could put a wall, maybe, or something like steel. But you hear what I'm saying? We all have these things. So if you're using any of those, please, I'm not trying to rebuke you. I don't know who's saying what. I've got them. Okay. I have all these kinds of things. I've got, to, and I stop, and I've got to remember this. God, God wants us to talk to him. He, he wants that relationship with us. And I think sometimes we choose words just to impress the people around us. And that makes these prayers selfish. They're about us, really. Even when we pray about other people, it's actually about us. Isn't that weird how that can be that way? I think people can see through us. Maybe you never miss a mealtime grace. You always say it, but you don't pray with your kids at bed or you don't pray with your spouse when there are no kids around. It's only to make sure your kids have a good upbringing. It's not for you. Why would anyone believe that we have a God that we love 
that we seek to please and honor, that we feel is on our side and intimately acquainted with our struggles and our grief if, if we just ritualistically throw stuff out. There's nothing wrong with written prayers or ritualistic prayers. I think they're fantastic. But we do need to stop and actually connect our heart with our words. I think I think people just don't believe that we're in that that we know God. And my I think about people in my own family. My my sister is I, I think she's left the faith. I think she'd probably say she's left the faith. And she said she the reason is she just hasn't found anyone worthy like anyone she believes. <laughs> And the reason I know this is because she told me that I'm the last one that she knows that at least holds on to his faith, limping, suffering, but holds on to it. And, you know, before you start going, well, yeah, I mean, you're the pastor and start putting him on some kind of pedestal. She talks to me like three times a year. She doesn't like I can fake anything three times a year. Like I'm the same miserable mess that everybody else is hypocritical, selfish. She just hasn't spotted it in me yet. She will. I mean, if, if she gets to know, she just doesn't put any, and the reason she doesn't put any Christians around her, so she doesn't even see that some of them are, are the same miserable, hypocritical wretches, but they actually say they're sorry, and they actually try. Like, right? Being a Christian doesn't mean that you got it figured out. You might be hypocritical sometimes. It means that you're resting on his grace. I mean, this is a call to not be that way, but it's also, I hope, a call to remember, oh, dear God, thank you for your grace that when we're this way, you still love us. Thank you for the cross that's taken our sin away. We all, we all struggle with wanting to be seen, to be, to be seen as better than whoever they are, that group that we outright despise or we gently mock or we roll our eyes at in secret. You, you know who they are. You've got them. I think it's um, Phil Yancey, Philip Yancey. Anybody read any of his books? Phil, good. Um, Philip Yancey is a, a Christian author and done a bunch of Bible studies and preached and stuff like that. He tells a story of um, having a Bible study with a group of people from Moody Bible Institute. Some of you might know Moody, where he went. And they were having this discussion, and it fell on hypocrisy in the church, and they were remembering the fact that their own uh, the rules for going to Moody required that they have uh, no mustache, no beard, and that their hair be a certain length. It couldn't go over the ears, right? And and they were just laughing about that because, first of all, you know, they'd grown up past that, and they were just like, whatever. But also they remember that that was the rule, but you entered into Moody Bible Institute to this huge picture of Moody who had broken all three of those rules. <laughs> Right, right there in the picture, he had a beard, he had a mustache, and his hair was long. And the rules were that they couldn't be that way. So they were just laughing about the hypocrisy of Christians. The problem was that somebody was sitting in the Bible study who'd been saved at Moody Bible Institute, and it was hugely precious to him. And he was listening to these people talk about this and just getting angrier and angrier to the point that he he basically just blurted out, you guys are the hypocrites, listen to you. Listen to you feeling all righteous about the way that you do Christianity versus the way they did Christianity. And everything fell right to Phil Yancey. She's just like, and they were waiting for his response. And his response was to own it. He said, yeah. Sometimes it's about us elitists who have passed all these, all these rules that everybody else has. And like those people who think dancing isn't okay anymore. Pfft, what dumb Christians they are. You see what we've just done? Like, you might be right, but you, you've, you've made this, you've become the hypocrite. You're starting to look down and be judgmental on other people. And we aren't, we're not talking here, this, this whole secrecy thing, this is, this is not about um, necessarily praying in a closet Right or you know doing the whole um, Priscilla Shire war room thing where you take all that stuff down. I mean, yes, no. What, what you do with that kind of stuff? It doesn't have to be that way. The question is, how do people see you? You can pray in secret and still be hypocritical, right? Like if you're putting all those pictures up all over your closet room so people can see that when they go into your closet, sometimes maybe it's in a more common spot. You can still be that way. You can still be selfish. It, that, that's possible. I don't think God is deceived by our 
pious prayers even when we're done, they're done in secret. Even when we're trying to impress God with our prayers. We don't trick him into thinking we're sincere just because we've got those papers that this guy's put in his closet. But please, can I, can I encourage you? Some of you need that. Some of you who haven't prayed in a long time, maybe this is exactly what you need. You need to take your walk-in closet and make the back of it a prayer, a war room. Okay, I'm not saying that that movie was all that great. I thought it was actually pretty pitiful. But the point, sorry, for the, you thought it was life-changing, right? But I think the point of it, that sometimes we need a war room. Okay, some of you are like, I have no idea. There's a Christian movie out there called War Room. Okay, so some people here have seen it. Right? We need to, like... A place where we go, where we intentionally go, and maybe we've got a list of things on the wall, taped right on the wall, so we can remember, because it brings us into prayer. Maybe some of you don't know how to pray longer than 30 seconds. Maybe you need to take that actual prayer list that we put in your bulletin every single week and tape it to the wall. Because that'll take you longer than 30 seconds just to read through. So read through it and say, yeah, I agree. If that's all you're doing, that's a huge step up from what you were doing yesterday, Right? Maybe this is exactly what you need, something that helps you to focus on him and reminds you of this. Maybe, maybe some of you need to move from, from praying through the prayer list, because that's something that you're used to doing, to praying through the countries. Right? There's, there's all kinds of lists out there. We can help you th- but what? pray through Rwanda and Sudan and Somalia this week. Find out something about them and pray for the things that they're struggling with. Why not? That would be a great way. I guarantee you'll be 30, more than 30 seconds in prayer. They need your prayers. Some of you need to pray with the mystics. I don't pray with the mystics. Maybe, maybe you need to. You need to learn a more contemplative kind of praying because the kind of praying that you're doing is, is boring to you. And you just keep on doing it. You need to take a step further in how you, how you relate to God. Some of you need to focus your prayers on gratitude and contentment. Some of you please need to do that. You are so wealthy and so well taken care of and so loved. You need to recognize all the things that God is doing. Some of you need to, some of you probably literally need to set an alarm on your phone, maybe two alarms on your phone to go off at different times during the day, like they used to do at New Testament times, actually. They didn't have an iPhone, they didn't set it on their phone, but they had a time that was, that they would actually call it out. Islam does something like this, right? They call it out, you're like, oh well, that's so ritualistic. Is it? Or is it a great reminder to pray? What if your alarm goes off no matter what? Within one minute of your alarm going off, no matter what meeting you're in, I, I, I don't know, you figure out what you can get away with, right? Where you just stop everything and you go off and you pray for a few minutes. And then you come back and you finish what you're doing. If you're on the phone, hey, can I call you back in just like three minutes? <laughs> would, that, would that not fo- refocus you? I'm kind of afraid to do it, but... And I've got the most flexible schedule out of anybody. But what a great way to do it. I'm, I'm thinking about maybe moving in that way. So I don't say these as laws. This is not God's prescribed way you have to do things. That's not it at all. These are invitations to a world of intimacy that few of us here know. And I wonder if we could take another step in knowing that. I started off saying, I, I don't always connect to God. I, I don't. I, said it, I even said sometimes prayer is, is boring, I think the truth is that I seldom choose praying over Brooklyn Nine-Nine with my boys. <laughs> if I've got a choice between doing one and not the other, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose TV pretty much. That's sad. I'm, I'm supposed to be the example. I've also said there are times that we break through, and maybe some of these are ways that we can begin to break through. We can renew our relationship with God where heaven is. Heaven and earth meet where they, where they crash into each other and we get times of reward that I can't even describe. You know, I, we've talked about that for every single, every single thing we've been talking about has been about a reward that God offers us. He, he says, if we do these in secret, if our, if our hearts and our minds connect together and it's not selfish and not hypocritical, it says God will reward us. The God who sees who we really are, who knows our actions, who, he knows our actions when they correspond to our, our hearts. He, he sees us. And he, 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 he sees you. He sees our struggles. And he meets us right there and he sees our sin and he forgives it. 
And he sees our ego and our pride and our hypocrisy and he invites us into something, something so much better. I'm in, I'm in the last 30 seconds at this point. I want you to, I want you to say, I, I am, I've been invited into a relationship with, with God and, and the reward for sincerity is, is abundant life. It's a life of flourishing and blessing and happiness and not the happiness of momentary pleasure, not that happy birthday to you stuff. We've talked about all that stuff, a happiness for a second, but, but a, a life walked with one who is intimately acquainted with us and who loves us completely. Can you imagine that? Walking with somebody who loves you no matter what, unconditionally, someone who never will walk away, who never gives up on you, doesn't gossip about you or find something better to do because he doesn't want to hang out with you tonight. This, this God truly wants to see you living life exuberantly and passionately and securely in him. Isn't that cool? God wants a relationship with you. And so he says, pray. When you pray, pray to me in secret. Talk to me. Don't do it for show. Let me pray for us. I think I can probably say no matter what, everyone here would love that. We would love that kind of relationship with you. Even people here who, who don't even know if you're around, like they would got to admit right now. Yeah, if you're here, that that is exactly what I want. I'd love to have a relationship with the divine where I can come and you'd walk next to us and you'd give us a flourishing and abundant life. And I don't, I don't know if I, I believe it 100%. So I asked before and I'm going to ask again. My words mean very little. You, Holy Spirit, you have to come with these words and you've got to reveal yourself. And I hope you have been throughout this whole sermon time. And I hope you keep doing that through our singing and through whatever other prayers or readings that we do today. And when we get home. And when we watch TV. And when we pray with our family or our spouse tonight, we pray that you would reveal yourself. Or when we rip out that part of the, our walk-in closet or not our walk-in closet and we just get down on our knees and we pray in there. We want to see you. We want heaven and earth to collide more than we can even say. We want this relationship with you. So God, help us on our own. We, we are not going to pull this off. Father, there's probably some people out here who don't know you at all. Would you, would you save them from themselves as you've saved so many of the rest of us? Show them the beauty of walking this path. Help them even now to confess their sins, to repent, to turn, and to follow after you. And for those of us who have done it, <laughs> we're doing it again. We're continuously repenting because we're, we're messes. And we still need you every day. Help all of us to walk a life that reflects you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.